And there we go. <laughs> so uh, actually, okay. this is this is the my first of a series of artist conversations that I'm doing. Um, so what is the? Oh, nice. Go ahead. We do have a lag. It's okay. You first. Okay. Yeah, we, I, I think we have about a two or three second lag time, so we'll just have to take that into account as we go along. Um, as I was saying, <clears throat> uh, this is the first of a series of artist conversations that I'm doing for Hyperallergic, and I'm recording these sessions in Adobe Connect because I want to have a good archive of the conversations. I'm not quite sure if this video will be used for anything, but I just I always like to... Um, have everything nicely archived. So that's why I've gone to the trouble of getting this all set up in the way that I have. But in any case, um, you know, th th this is really intended to be um, a kind of, you know, I have a series of questions, but, it, but I just want to kind of keep a conversation going uh, between the two of us. And when I do the piece, um, I'm going to write a short introductory uh, context piece and to set it up so that we can just, go right into our conversation. So don't worry about, you know, providing a lot of background information. Uh, I'll do my best to do that. And, uh, and we can just kind of let the conversation flow along. So, um, so I don't know if you have, let me know if you have any questions uh, before we get started. And then I can also figure out exactly how much lag time we have. No, I'm I'm good. I'm happy to talk to you and looking forward to the conversation. Uh, okay, great. I think we have about three seconds of lag, <laughs> and it's it's because of the bandwidth, but uh, I think it'll be fine. So, okay, well here we go. Um, so, uh, well, you know, as I as I mentioned, I've been I've just completely I have dove in to your work. I think I've I've gone through as as much of your writing as I I possibly could in the course of a few days and. You know, I discovered your work a couple of years ago um, uh, when I, I saw the, um, the Bold 3R piece, which just completely blew me away. And, uh, you know, I, and I have some questions and some, some things I wanted to ask you about that piece in particular. But I want to start off with this idea of the way in which you, you blend everything. I mean, in your life, in your work, uh, your practice, your the theory that you do communications, writing, teaching, it all seems to blend together. Uh, and there's a kind of melange of language and a sort of spirit and playfulness. It all seems to flow together with glitch. And I was wondering if you would say that glitch is a way of life. Yes, I mean, I think, in fact, uh, well, first off, I'd like to say, you know, thanks for uh, for having, uh, you know, given the work the level of attention that you have and um, having thought through these uh, approaches that I'm taking and trying to uh, take and represent um, in the world, but also that make the most um, sense uh, for me. Um, because I think that uh, my approach to digital uh, arts or new media art is one that takes a, a systems approach, um, not in a kind of cold cybernetics way, but in a, a more holistic um, sense of, of system or systematic uh, thinking. Um, those systems might be broken, they might be glitched, they might be imperfect and noisy, and that might also be what attracts uh, us or me to those systems, but still they are functional or functioning in one way or another um, systematically. So they are like connected to one another. Uh, so there's this kind of like focus that I have on um, making these types of connections, uh, but also on attempting to undermine uh, distinctions between categories in order to get this kind of slippage and, and flow between categories where there's leak um, because, you know, Trinity Minha categories always leak. Uh, we have this imperfect human impulse to, um, 
to be making these categories, but there's they're they're never uh, they're never so stabilized as to be completely discrete. I mean, they're they're useful and functional, but uh, their their leakages are also really exciting. I think. Well, there's a lot of leakage going on in your work. That's that's clear. And uh, so, you know, I would say that that glitch is a language uh, spoken by its practitioners who have commingled code with the spoken word. Or maybe I should say, you know, specifically in terms of your work, uh, mixing up machine language with human language. What really interests me about what you do, accepting mm -hmm. accepting the aberration as perhaps more important than the message. So is the aberration the message? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely say that there's a poetic embrace uh, of noise and error. Um, my, my interests are also, uh, have been and continue to be motivated by the connections between, for instance, noise musics and experimental new media art so, um, you know, uh, for me, this this approach to noise or noisiness and and dirt or dirtiness is uh, a way to foreground, um, as you say, a kind of um, aberrance or perversion of uh, normative message or what we might perceive to be the the logical reasoning, um, because there's a poetics to that, obviously, um, and People who inspired me most directly in that manner would be like Natachka Nezvanova, um, who I really consider to be like the most important artist of the turn of the last century. Um, you know, Mez Breeze, Marianne uh, Breeze, Jody, you know, these, these very uh, influential people who uh, influenced so many of us, but myself included, definitely. Um, with Natachka Nezvanova really being someone who, who did this commingling of uh, functional code um, with also highly politicized and, and poetic language. Yeah, I, re I remember um, I remember when uh, NATO uh, came out in the I guess the early two thousands, late nineties perhaps, and the infiltration of that language into mailing lists and and it was quite an extraordinary um uh sabotage of of the of the new media scene in many ways and i i remember i you know i've been using max and msp for years and i used nato when it came out and it was really quite quite an interesting time um but you know in, in regards to dirty new media which is quite an interesting concept given the the cleanliness of the technology industry um you've said that um Dirty new media artists are interested in exploring the ways in which technological systems and equipment can be realigned, modified, and played with critically. So is glitch an act of undermining the status quo of our relationship to technology? It certainly can be. Um, and, and I think I'm not really nostalgic, but I think that there was maybe a time in which glitch uh, works were more directly uh, mobilizing that kind of uh, critical stance. Um, but that time, I think, is a recent historical uh, moment. It's, you know, it's a recent historical moment because glitch is also always already. Um, now being compromised in the sense of being folded into an aesthetics uh, that are also highly popular. So um, there's a there's a there's a popularity to the glitch aesthetic, um, which would undermine you know an argument for saying that it is exclusively resistant or exclusively political. Um, it, it's just impure. I mean, that's that's a kind of at the heart of glitch is impurity, and and I'm an impurist, so um, this doesn't trouble me so much. But it, it is worth noting that I don't think it can really be. I, I wouldn't defend a, a purist position around 
uh, glitches, resistant uh, qualities, but, but it's possible. You can do that for sure. Well, but you can also do, um, I mean, <laughs> you know, you can do anything else with it simultaneously. Well, this is a problem. I think that is, you know, as long as the history of art is that it, the minute you have an avant-garde and a new language, it gets co-opted by by other artists, by the popular culture, and so on. And, and I think, I guess, you could say the same for glitch. We see glitch is pervasive now in mainstream design and media. So, yeah, I guess the the real challenge, I suppose, is is how do you stay one step ahead with those that that would uh, mainstream the work that you do. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I don't think it's so much a problem of art. I think it's more a situation of hyper capitalism. It's it's just a reality that we live with in global, you know, hyper capitalism. So, um, you're right. It's not special to glitch, but it does occur in glitch for sure. And um, also, this uh, idea, sort of this linear idea of staying. A step ahead um, isn't necessarily where where I'm coming from, but more that uh, commitments, making ethical commitments, and 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 making uh, you know positions that um, one might take up. It, not to say that they you wouldn't ever take up other positions, but just to kind of clearly articulate ethical positions or or positions that are intentional and and motivated. And then to, to take those up sincerely and commit to them um, is one way, in some cases, not to even be a step ahead, but to outlast uh, <laughs> passing interests. Uh, like Kanye West's passing interest in Glitch, uh, you know, is easily outlasted by sincerity and commitment to the potentialities of, of the form. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, and then he's he's going to he and his people are going to discover other, uh, you know, super niches and, and uh, you know, attitudes to adopt. But you know, being committed to something is, is a different uh, approach. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that that um, ultimately, you know, if you're if you're true and you're honest with the work that you do, then it it lives survives um you know i i wanted to say that <clears throat> i see mm -hmm. i see so many resonances mm -hmm. with um um uh, avant-garde figures you know in both in art and and technology such as uh dick higgins for example um in his concept of intermedia i see a lot of the thinking that dick higgins talked about um surfacing in your work um this idea of closing the gap between art and life media and things uh, and in your case, language and machine language, art and theory, or as Dick Higgins might have said, art and mm -hmm. everything else. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I'm absolutely inspired by Dick Higgins and by um, the the moment at which uh, you know he was he was coming from a, s a certain um, moment, uh, a discourse. And there are obviously other people that were also part of that discourse, um, and then that discourse on on art life and you know art and life um, or art slash life, uh, you know, has influenced so many different fields. Especially for me, the influence on um, performance, performance art, um, you know, uh, the way in which I, those were uh, topics that I definitely studied when I was younger. And uh, then thinking about how um, the technologies that we use are all social, and so uh, they're, they're techno-social, right? And we live in a techno-social -so culture, so these technologies are also socially performed, and that means that there's this performative aspect uh, on on different sides. So, for instance, you know, there's a corporate performance of cleanliness and, and purity. And then there's the performances of everyday life that, that we're all doing all the time with all of our technologies. And so we're, we, we're making them human in the sense that we're making them part of our lives. And also people, I think younger people 
distinguish less and less between the categories of what maybe generationally older people would uh you know i i don't like to play those cards very often but i do think that generationally there have been different periods of time where people saw a more or less you know hard line between the technological and the human or the technological and the social and now those are so deeply intertwined that i think that generationally people um are more i would hope uh um attuned to to dick higgins and that kind of attitude about you know yeah the constant flows yeah there's another aspect of it too though that's interesting which is the relationship between um the artist and the machine the artist and the technology i think a lot of people at first glance might look at your work and think that it's and and, and the work of um NATO, for example, might look at that work and think that it's been completely usurped by machine language, by a kind of technological sensibility. And so I'm wondering, mm -hmm. you know, in, in view of this convergence between human language mm -hmm. and machine language, the question then might become, where does the machine end and the artist begin? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's a great question. Um, well, I mean, the the machine world is machined by us out of the world. I mean, we have machined the world. So it's our world in the sense that uh, we have crafted it and, and we're constantly crafting and recrafting it. And it produces uh, errors, mistakes, breakdowns, glitches, noise and and you know, from a sort of computer science perspective, uh, what you would want to do would be to um, be debugging uh, and refining. But from a dirty new media perspective, what you might want to be doing is rebugging and, um, you know, pushing different uh, aspects of the machined world to see their thresholds and to experiment and, and play. I mean, you said playfulness earlier. Um, which I'm really happy to hear that you recognize in the work. And so, uh, you know, there's a part of it that's also about having this playful attitude um, and not being not being uh, overwhelmed by dystopic uh, possibilities. Although the robot apocalypse does concern me. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it, <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, in a way what you I think what you have done is that rather than, I mean, you could very well take a dystopic view of, of I mean, glitch could be uh, construed as taking a, a dystopic view of, of humanity in terms of its incorporation and, and uh, assimilation of, of technology on a, on a daily basis. And, but I think what you do, in a sense, is that you undermine the dystopic by, by allowing play to be the overriding dynamic of the work that you do. Ultimately, there's a kind of Dada playfulness to it that that I think undermines the dystopic nature of tech at, that we could have view that we could have towards technology. Thank you, thank you very much. I really hope that that is um, the case. That's that's definitely a goal that I'm constantly uh, working on, and I would like to say also that. There, there are those in my immediate community that are, um, you know, that I'm also responding to who are, in fact, uh, in glitch, glitch art communities um, who are dystopic and who are also discordian, who are intentionally um, performing kind of, you know, ver different versions of, of chaos magic or who have aspirations to that kind of chaos magic and, and that kind of discordian approach. And that's not, that's not my intent. Um, although there's like edges of that that have resonance for me, uh, I'm definitely not a discordian um, or, or want to uh, um, overcode negativity, which is something that other that people misperceive 
is this overcoated negativity too. Well, I, I love the way that you actually counter those dystopic questions that you get with, with an even greater barrage of, um, <laughs> of glitch. <laughs> Um, for example, there's there's a comment that Sterling Sterling Crispin made when he said that he said the glitch noise fetish is an inversion of humanity and symbolic embrace of death and rampant infectious nihilism. Okay, so and your response was, and of course we can't see all that. I'll I'll just throw in the hashtags, but you said thanks at Sterling Crispin. My work is an an actual process of hashtag glitch, hashtag fetish, hashtag noise. Hashtag dirty, hashtag new media from a hashtag humanist, hashtag perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was funny. <laughs> and um, also sincere. I mean, it's like it was, I was, uh, it was playful and, and sincere and, and I hope a little bit funny, but also pointed because I took that, I took his comment very pointedly. And, uh, you know, motivated me to write this entire uh, essay, which is up on the gl1tch.us, the, that uh, unstable book for unstable media that I'm constantly working on. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I took, I took his comment very, very pointedly, and I wanted to really respond to it um, because, you know, he used a couple of keywords uh, that I'm connected to and that that um, motivate me. So, like, he was using fetish, but he was uh, using it in a, in a negatively valenced way. Uh, and I wanted to reclaim fetish and say, yeah, fetish is, of course, fetish is part of what I do because fetish is punk rock and it's part of, like, originary punk rock from the sex shop, Malcolm McLaren and uh, Vivian Westwood. And, I mean, yeah, of course, fetish is in my work, but it's in this way that's... Um, consistent with with uh, art life and, and life in a way that is dirty and um, dirty in the sense of being impure, but also hopefully sexy um, and exciting, you know. So um, he was kind of like negatively valencing things uh, or negative, negatively valencing ideas that that I hold closely. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, humor, humor is powerful. There's no doubt about it. And and I think the best the best response to uh, a question like that is, is the answer that you gave. You know, um, speaking of sexy, uh, there's an aspect of Dirty New Media, which is, you know, which has, yeah. has thoroughly em embraced. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, sorry, this is, uh, anyway, but one more thing about, about him and, and <laughs> is that uh, he so he made this comment and I responded and then it's not just this you know few tweets or whatever but like I wrote this pretty lengthy essay that's about it that's illustrated with original stuff that I made also um, and original media and then I've been using that media and that essay uh, you know in talks and etc and so it's pretty it's pretty like like you said um, a kind of minor comment and then my uh, response is like to produce um, much more content than than this one uh, co comment. But uh, then I posted that we're also like we're Facebook friends and whatever. Like um, for for what for you know for the reasons uh, that we all know that everything is socially networked. And so I posted all of this also on his um, Facebook. You know, like, hey, man, I uh, wrote this essay. I uh, think you might like it because it's motivated by this comment you made. And uh, <laughs> so, and his response at first was like, oh, man, oh, boy. And then he, like, read it or, or looked at it or whatever and saw how, how, I think, just, like, the volume of it, too. And then he just went back and, like, deleted his, uh, his comments about it so that it just wouldn't show up on his page anymore. And I, I just love this like social interplay part too, where, um, you know, it's kind of like response, counter response, response, counter response, like ongoing process. Yeah. Well, your, your tactic is very interesting because, uh, there's, there's, you know, I've often heard that, um, the idea of, of whoever has the, the most information wins and uh, produces the most information wins. And that's exactly, <laughs> I think, what you're doing here. Um, there, there's an aspect of Dirty New Media, which is dealing with, the, talk about, you know, the sexual and, or sexy, 
there's an aspect of dirty media which is concerned with pornography, and um, and you know at, at one point. Um, looking through a few of the Tumblr feeds, I began to think that maybe that's what dirty new media really is all about. <laughs> yeah, but um, it, it, I understand it's, it's about much more than that. But I would like to just get you to comment on on this uh, on how you have um, incorporated pornography into your work, and and the question you know would be does does glitch render the pornographic image something else, something removes perhaps something even asexual. Some, something else, something removed, and then it broke up a little bit. Was there something asexual? Another part to that? Oh, asexual. Asexual? Asexual. Huh. That's interesting. Um, I haven't thought about it in. That in those ter in the terms of asexuality or removing sexuality, uh, although I th I could imagine what that might mean, but for me it's more the reverse. It's more of a way to um, engage with the fact that the media that we use the technologies that we uh, that we use that surround us that that we're a part of that are a part of us are um, sexualized because well for for lots of different reasons but um, one of the reasons being that we're using them they're they're a part of our lives and so our lives uh, we're sexual beings we must be we have to be uh, if we are to be a species um, with it can sustain itself. So um, just by that, those natural facts of of, of life, um, then what we uh, what we have um, becomes um, sexualized. In you know, even if it's um, well, whatever it is, really. And in kink culture, the term for that is uh, pervertible, which is to say that anything can, you know, any anything can be uh, pervertible, right? Like, here's a pervertible object right here, and uh, there's pervertible objects all around us, but also that media is already perverse. It's already being perverted um, by us for, for various purposes. And that's also in the histories of technologies and, and their genealogies. You know, VHS beta, for instance. I mean, the internet, the web. There's there are really substantial ways in which um, basic technologies have been, you know, video on the internet. The fact that we're doing what we're doing today, having this conversation, this is all motivated by what some people might refer to as pornography, um, in terms of like being a real engine for making these technologies happen because socially. That's been a motivating engine for creating these technologies, or for for pushing them, you know, forward um, technologically. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting though. It, I, I had, you know, I had a completely different take on this because um, it seems to me that you know that the way in which you are presenting pornography and remixing it and distorting it and looping it and glitching it, um, it and actually it loses its original intent it loses any kind of it doesn't seem at all sexy anymore mm -hmm. it seems maybe it's a you know a perversion in the sense that it's no longer sexual to me it becomes um just media and it because it just becomes part mm -hmm. of the the vocabulary of of our kind of saturated mm -hmm. media experience but it, it's no longer about sex Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that can also be true, and that's I, yeah, I definitely appreciate that reading. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so anyway, um, let, I want to go on though about dirty new media because I'm I'm really interested in this idea. And so, in regards to dirty new media, 
you know, my my response is that dirtiness implies there is a human quality in new media. That it is not perfect, it's not sterile, it's 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 um you know, it's not removed from real life, but it contains its imperfections, its impurities, in a way, its organic qualities that bring it closer to our wet lives, uh, rather than our binary ones. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's absolutely part of the goal um, in terms of uh, using this term, uh, dirty new media, is to foreground all of those um, facts uh, that you just mentioned, um, which are, for instance, uh, also that there is a, um, a non-neutrality of technosocial artifacts and contexts, that our technologies are, are, are not neutral. Um, also that they are, as you say, embedded. Um, they're, they're part of our lives. Um, and that embeddedness um, has, you know, has the word bed in there. We're in bed with them. Also, they're embedded in, a, in, in ways that are um, complex, um, that they're not sterile, as you say. They're not perfect. They're imperfect. They're um, not clean um, because they exist in, in the world, which is uh, also, you know, imperfect. Um, and so I do believe that dirty new media uh, as a way of life and also as an approach to art making is a, a, a way of foregrounding these facts, these realities of um, our lived experiences and um, acknowledging like how situated, uh, how situated we are with all of these systems and, and artifacts. Yeah, it's and, like assemblage, right? It's yeah, like... and and like the 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 avant garde of past times, uh, and I think about you know John Cage and, and many other. And your work really, you know, we haven't talked about John Cage, but I would say more than any other artist, I see the influence of Cage in your work. Um, and I, for me personally, I'm a big uh, devotee of Cage. I knew him personally, and I see in the way that you perform. Uh, in the way that you approach art and life, um, in the way that you have constructed your own language, in the way that you have built a community around your work, uh, all of that, mm -hmm. it's all, you know, it's, it's, art is a way of mm -hmm. life and art is a, is a connective tissue to life itself and the world mm -hmm. that we live in. Um, it just seems to me that your work is, is deeply rooted in, in that sensibility, which is in many ways, counter to the world that we live in today, maybe completely counter to the world that we live in today with our, our corporate environment, mm -hmm. our sterile, uh, you know, approach to technology, the technology companies and Apple computer that, that would, you know, that, oh, that, uh, you know, and try to encourage the fetish of technology is what you have done is that through this construction of a language and a world that you've created, You've you've attempted to break that down and really show us what our relationship to to these things could be and maybe should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely, and and um, open up possibilities and open up potentialities for for people um, as well as you know for for myself, um, but also. For a community um, that can mobilize around these approaches, these ideas, and also that can um, open them up and um, expand them, experiment with these ideas. Um, you know, so as you say, it's uh, it, it's also counterintuitive from a certain perspective in terms of um, capital A art because it's it's counterintuitive to the rampant. Um, Hyper individualism um, that you know lays waste to so much uh, effort, which really emerges from group practices or communities, or, or you know the ways in which people have to develop um, a discourse or language. And so you know, attribution coming from open source culture, like attribution, is at least uh, a, a pathway to. Um, referencing, you know, and saying, okay, for instance, 
uh, not not dropping names to be uh, to be um, a, a lexicon or an encyclopedia, but to to say these are reference points. These are I'm attributing, you know, inspiration. So certainly, yeah, Fluxus, absolutely, um, Cage, Pike, um, the early video moment. Um, you know, people here in Chicago, which is which is my area of of research um, from media art history's perspective. Um, so Phil Morton, Jane Veter, Dan Sandine, this idea of building a community and building tools and systems and sharing those tools and systems within the community so the community can organize around all of that uh, and then share work and the work goes back out into the community to, to keep it alive. Obviously, all of this is like, I just sketched out a pedagogy, right? I mean, like, obviously, all of this is also academic uh, in nature. Yeah, and it's, it's, um, it's a wonder to me how you balance your, your artistic life and your academic life, <laughs> knowing how diametrically opposed they can be, but you seem to have blended them together rather successfully. I don't know how you do that. You must have a very supportive institution behind you. Thank you. I I have I have a I have a supportive institution. I have a supportive um, department. I have a wonderful wife who I love, <laughs> um, who's uh, I Jen Janet Lynn, an artist based here in Chicago, who's mm. you know really wonderful. Uh, and so, <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's a way in which it requires a lot of support and constant um, work. But you also, I mean, I, I pushed on, I mean, this is maybe not so much for the interview, but just like because you said so, um, you know, there's institutional resistance and, and I pushed on certain uh, aspects of that. Like I, I had to make constant arguments throughout different processes to explain that what we're talking about today, that I'm crafting a language that there's a reason why it needs to be written this way or said this way. So the you know I think but also that's a healthy friction for me. It's, it gives me also you know inspiration to to um, to work outside of the institution to work in um, you know bars and um, DIY DIT spaces and you know alternative space. So um, it, it's a good it's a good healthy dynamic yeah well i i can imagine that your students must i mean the glitch just in general is highly infectious and the st students really are drawn to it and i can imagine that your students must be all glitching out constantly <laughs> in, in in the classes that you teach i i would imagine that <laughs> that um it, it must be you must have the opposite problem of of um making sure that your students don't all become glitch artists simply because it is so infectious yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, teaching, uh, as you know, requires a great deal of generosity, and it is possible to be a, an ungenerous teacher, but you're not going to be a very good teacher. So, um, yeah, you have to be very generous, and and when you, and especially also in the glitch communities, there's a lot of uh, in dirty new media. Also, there's a lot of sharing of technique, um, and a lot of you know open sourcing, or at least sharing of um, approaches and practices. And so, you know, that can have the effect also of people, you know, learning to reproduce certain um, styles or certain uh, aesthetics. Um, but the way, I think, to um, not be stuck in that is to uh, focus also on uh, glitch as a form of surprise and as a, as a way of um, glitching people's expectations. And that brings it back to performance again, really, mm -hmm. makes it performative. Um, and then Dan Sandine, you know, who's been super inspirational to me, at one point uh, said to me that uh, we were asking him a question about what happens when, when his students rediscover what he has done. They do, it, they do it themselves, but they don't, they're not aware that they've now done something that he did 30 years ago. And he said, oh, it's cool, you know, everybody's got to find their own path. Um, 
And that was just a really beautiful moment for me, really inspirational for me to hear him say that. And I took that to heart. And I think that's really true that, you know, everybody's got to um, find their own their own ways. And there's so many ways. There's as many ways as there are people. So, um, you know, we're all we're going to cross paths and that's that's helpful. Yeah. Well, John, this, maybe that's a good place to end, although I think we had a good ending a little while back. And it's been it's actually nice just to sort of chat with you and uh, off the record, um, as it were. But um, Likewise. yeah, this is really Likewise. Been, Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll um, I'll let you know when I've got this thing all together. <laughs> and because uh, I, I have to transcribe, you know, you okay. know, you know, the one cool. thing I wanted to ask you just in terms of the piece itself is that um, it, the, the only problem with, I thought about doing this as an email interview um, and and because the only problem with doing this as you know, the way that we've done it, which I prefer this way because I think it's more intimate. It's just more personal to do it, you know, over mm -hmm. over video conferencing. But but the one thing that's missing, though, is is to having your your language in your language, your you know, in the written language. And so, um, if, mm -hmm. if it's okay, I'm, I, I wouldn't want you to have to do this with the entire thing, but I may send a few little passages here and there that maybe you could, you could rewrite in, and in, into your language, um, that we could insert back into sure. the, into the piece. Um, just a few things, because I sure. think that I don't, I, I don't want the reader to miss out, you know, on, on just the wonderfully poetic nature of how you write. I, I think that it's kind of part of who you are as an artist. Uh, and so, so maybe we can collaborate. I don't want to make you do too much work on this, but maybe we can collaborate a little bit just in terms of getting some of your, your uh, glitch language into the piece. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thanks so much. And, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to um, getting this piece out there into the world. <laughs> Likewise. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it too. Yeah.